good evening to you, pilgrims and strangers. And to the rest of you, before the meeting is over, we hope you'll be pilgrims and strangers too. Amen. See your pilgrim and stranger here or there. Well, I hope you're one here. See here are those of you that are in Christ tonight. I'd like to remind you that you've been blessed with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's the truth. Amen. I'd like to remind you you've been raised up with Christ and made to sit together with heavenly places in Him. I'd like to remind you that you were buried with Christ into His death and raised up to walk in a new life. I'd like to remind you of that. Amen. And that you've been redeemed from the hand of the enemy, that God's for you is not against you. That you've been sanctified, justified, and washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's your Father. Jesus is your brother. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Your name's written in heaven. And the angels are your ministers. Now, for those of you that aren't Christians, we hope before you leave here, you become one. Because if you don't, you'll go to hell. Amen. Now, we're not going to pretend in these meetings at all. And I don't want you to pretend. And if you do, I'll be able to tell. Because you see, I walk with God. I can tell when people pretend. So be honest about it. And if you're in Christ, be glad you're in Christ. And if you're not, be glad you can be. Because I'm going to tell you, you can't be washed from your sins. You can't have your name written in heaven. You can be exonerated and forgiven. You can be on your way to heaven and happy. Tonight. Beginning tonight. Now, before I begin, I do want to make three quick announcements. I always like to make announcements. Some of our churches, announcements is one of the main features in the church service. And so I'd like to preach a few announcements. On these announcements, I'd like to have people respond during the announcements. I will 
will tell you what the trouble with the contemporary church is. It is too far from Jesus. Amen. It has drifted away from the Son of God. And God has ordained there's not a person on earth or in heaven that can violate this. You can't walk at a distance from God and be good and be right and be accepted by God. If God's a stranger to you, you are dead in trespasses and sins. Makes no difference how many Sunday school friends you have, or how long you've gone to church, or how well you know the quarterly, or what kind of office you hold in the assembly. If God's strange to you, if you can't think like God, you don't see things like God sees them. You don't understand his book when you read it. Then the answer is identity with Christ. Amen. The answer is to be joined to the Lord. Amen. Well, the Bible says this. In 1 Corinthians 6, 17, it says, Whoever is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Now, that's what you want. And in that, you become like God. He doesn't become like you. Some people think when they get together with God that God becomes like them. Oh, no, we become like God Amen. when we're joined with him. Now, the central figure in all of history, as you know, is Jesus. Now, it's one thing to say that. It's another thing to embrace it. Jesus' death is a pivotal truth of Scripture. It's a hub of Scripture. Christ's death. A lot hinges on Christ's death. Our destiny hinged on Christ's death. And what happened when Jesus died? Now, we're going to talk about dying with Jesus. So I want, first of all, to talk about his death. His death is the preeminent death. Amen. Not our death. His cross is the preeminent cross, not our cross. When Jesus died, a number of things happened. Jesus appeared once in the end of the world to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's Hebrews 9, 26. That's what he came into the world to do. To put away sin, to pick it up, put it together, carry it in his own body, and take it away. Take it away from who? He didn't take it away from the world, it's still here. He didn't take it away from people, they're still here. He took it away from God. He took it away from God's vision so God could be free to bless people. He carried it away from God so he could be just and justified of him that believes in Jesus. Amen. He appeared to put away sin. And the closer you get to God, the further you get from sin. The more aware you are of Jesus, the more utter hatred you have for sin. Amen. There are some things you cannot stand anymore because you're with Christ and Christ made an end of sin. That's what Daniel said he knew. He'd make an end of sin, finish the transgression, and bring in everlasting righteousness. So he took it away. The scripture says in 1 Peter 1.24, I believe that he bore our sins in his body on the tree. He took them all, and Jesus up on the tree was sin incarnate. When Jesus was born, he was God manifest in the flesh. When he died, he was sin made known in the flesh. And God dealt a devastating blow to sin, and it occurred when Jesus died. And whenever you're united with Jesus' death, you'll die to sin too. You'll lose your love for it, and you'll develop a hatred for it. No one will have to beat you on the head and tell you you shouldn't sin. You'll know it, and you'll hate it. And you'll run from it. Flee fornication. Oh, don't tell me. Now, there's another thing that happened when Jesus died. Not only did he take away sin, he took away the basis of sin. Colossians 2.14 says, a beautiful language, he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The handwriting of ordinances. It was more than the Ten Commandments. It was the Ten Commandments as a covenant. God had told people, here's my agreement, the first covenant's this. You do what I say without failure, without mistake, without any error at all. You do everything I say, and I'll accept you. That was the book. The scriptures say this over and over, this do and live. That was the agreement of the law. But instead of us living, we incurred a tremendous debt toward God. We amassed 
a debt every time we infracted the law, the debt was increased to God. We robbed him of his glory. Every time someone breaks God's law, they're saying, I am God. He is not God. I will do what I want, not what God wants. And it robs him of his glory before men. And God doesn't like to be robbed of his glory. He will not allow it. Someday he's going to settle up with everybody that has robbed him of his glory. Anyone and everyone that has shined the spotlight at themselves at the expense of putting it on God will answer. God will call it into account. But if you're in Christ, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, including the great debt that your sin amassed has been blotted out. Amen. Nailed to the cross. Not even the eye of God Almighty can see sin in people that are in Christ. Even though all things are naked and open before him with whom we have to do, he sees everything, but he cannot see sin that Jesus has put away. He cannot see it. How precious it is. But that's not all. When Jesus died, he destroyed the devil. I never tire of preaching about this. I never want it to become old to me. I don't want it just to be a sermonic outline that Satan was destroyed when Jesus died. Now the Bible says this. This is not an interpretation. It says that he, Jesus, through death, destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. That's Hebrews 2.14. He destroyed the devil who had the power of death. How did he destroy the devil? Destroy doesn't mean annihilate. That ought to be obvious because our adversary, the devil, is walking around seeking whom he may devour. So he's not been annihilated. He's been rendered impotent in this heavenly place. Amen. When you walk with God up here in the realm of faith, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to learn what I'm talking about. If you don't know what being in the heavenly places is about, you need to learn it. This is Bible talk we're talking about. When you walk in the spirit, you live by faith. You live with your mind pitched toward heaven. You walk with God. You live by grace. It's all talking about the same thing. When you're up here, Satan is impotent. He can't do anything up here with people that are walking hand in hand with Christ. Amen. Amen. In fact, you remember what James said. James, the brother of our Lord, he was raised in the same house as Jesus was. James said, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Why will he flee? Because he's afraid of you. Don't think for one moment he's afraid of you. He's not. But he cannot stand against the Christ that's in you Amen. and in whom you stand. He is repulsed by Jesus. He is abducted by Jesus. You know, occasionally, up in the north, uh, western part of Indiana, where we live, this is a highly industrialized area. There were oil factories up there. And occasionally, they would emit an odor that, like, wasn't pleasant. And people didn't want to be around there at that time. They were abducted by it, turned off by it, and they got away from it. Truth is an obnoxious odor to Satan. Jesus is an obnoxious odor and vision to Satan because Jesus has crushed his head. Amen. He has a mortal bruise he's carrying around. He's going to die of this bruise. Amen. And so when you walk in the spirit, you're up here in a realm where Satan has been destroyed. Someone said they were flying a plane one time. It was a, a prop airplane and a, and a rat was gnawing at the wires in the cockpit. And the pilot tried to reach under there and find it. He couldn't, he couldn't get this rat. He knew if the rat ever gnawed the wires in two, he'd plummet to earth. There was only one thing to do. He soared up into a high altitude where rats can't live. That's what you do in Christ. You rise up into a realm where Satan can't exist, where sin can't dominate. You're up here in a suffocates. This suffocates flesh Amen. when you're up here. See, that's what our church services be like. Amen. We just meet together and rise up in the heavenlies and suffocate the flesh. <laughs> get rid of it. Amen. Not going to enter in anyway. Flesh and blood can't enter the kingdom. Amen. So why try and get it in here? Amen. Just suffocate. <laughs> now here's another thing that happened when Jesus died. He spoiled. Spoiled means robbed or plundered. He spoiled principalities and powers. That's Colossians 2.15. He spoiled principalities and powers and made a display of them openly, triumphing over them in his cross. So what he did, these principalities and powers actually dominated the world. They ruled the world. Roman Empire.
Empire was dominated by spiritual forces. The Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, see, they were all dominated by spiritual forces. Daniel the ninth chapter tells about it. Daniel, when he knew by books that the Babylonian captivity was about to come to an end, he was reading Jeremiah's books, incidentally, he set himself to pray. And he prayed for 21 days and no answer came. After 21 days, an angel came and said, Fear not, Daniel, from the moment you set yourself to pray, I was dispatched to come here. But on the way here, I encountered the prince of Persia, one of these principalities and powers that Jesus has spoiled. And anyway, I fought with him for 21 days. This is an angel, though. One angel destroyed 185,000 of Sennacherib's army. They're powerful. But this one angel engaged an adversary, a satanic, demonic adversary, for 21 days. And he said, after that, Michael came. And Michael delivered me, and I come down to give you this answer to your prayer. Now I'm going to go back, and we're going to resume the battle. And when we overthrow this power, the prince of Persia is going to come. See, they ruled the world, but not since Jesus died. There has never been a world power since Jesus rose and went up into heaven. The last one was Rome, and it was decimated by the kingdom of Christ. He spoiled principalities and powers. And let me tell you something. In this world, it makes no difference who the person is. Whether he's a hot and tot in Africa or sitting in a jail cell or sitting in a church or a bar, there are no cells that have doors on them since Jesus died. Amen. He has lifted the doors off of all moral prisons. And anyone and everyone makes no difference who wants to come out of sin can come out. Anyone who wants to come to Christ can come. That's right. Anyone who wants to drop off habits that condemn can drop them off. They can. Right. It doesn't make any difference how long they live with it. It doesn't make any difference. Someone said you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Nonsense. Right. It's not true. If Manasseh could repent after living more than three score years in sin, I say you can repent after living a few years in it. You can come to God because Jesus has spoiled the powers that captivated people. They've been destroyed. And I like Paul's way of saying it to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.10. He says, he abolished death. He abolished death. Yeah, church doesn't preach this. Have you ever noticed that? All right, anybody knows this. Jesus said to Mary and Martha, he said, he that lives and believes in me shall never die. Then he asked, do you believe this? We need to be asking this to people. You'll never die. Why not? Because I'm dead already. See, death is just a transition. It's just dropping the body. Jesus has abolished death. Nothing can separate us now but the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And he reconciled us to God. How I love the truth. God was in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 says, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. God was in Christ, Amen. bringing us back. God was in Christ, making us like him. God was in Christ, bringing us into the family again. See, those who don't think they can come in are just wrong. They're just wrong. They're deceived. Those who say they can't make progress towards Christ, they're just wrong. God has reconciled us to himself through Christ. His arms are wide open. He's saying, there's no hindrance up here. There's nothing holding heaven back. Angels are waiting. Jesus is waiting. God is waiting. The Spirit's waiting. And we've even got a great cloud of witnesses has already made it from here to there. And they're waiting. See, anyone that thinks they can't come is just wrong. What a gospel we have to preach. Amen. Kind of makes you wonder why it's not preached very much, doesn't it? And Jesus sanctified the people. Sanctified, I don't want to be afraid of that word. I don't like translations that give easy words for hard words. I like the hard words and you have to dig in and figure what they mean. Sanctified means now God can use you. He took you out of the garbage can and he puts you in the, in the cooking cabinet. He puts you where he could use you. That's a sanctified man. And Hebrews 13, 12 says, He sanctified the people with his blood. When he died, God said, I can use these people now. I can talk to these people now. I can serve with
with their hands now. I can run through their feet now. I'll work through them, see. He sanctified the people. Christ. You see how a great deal happened when Jesus died. Now, the Word of God tells us that when Jesus died, actually everybody died. What a remarkable statement this is. Now, actually, everyone is dead in one sense or another. Either you're dead to God or you're dead to the world. No one's in between. No one straddles the fence. No one is half alive to the world, half alive to God. No such thing. Is dead or alive. That's the way it is. In fact, the scripture tells us, in Adam, all die. That's Romans 5.15. In Adam, everybody dies. They're all dead to God is the idea. Ephesians 2.1 says they're dead in trespasses and sins. That is, they're immersed in the stuff God can't stand. In sin, they're dead. Dead means they can't respond to God. They can't hear God. They can't sense God. They're unaware of God. They don't live for God. They live for themselves. Their decisions are based on themselves. Their likes are based on their own preferences. They're dead to God. But in Christ Jesus, you can come out of that category and be alive to God and dead to the world. So when the, dead, when the world hollers, you can't hear. And when God speaks, you can. And the scriptures say, refuse not him that is speaking from heaven. Don't refuse him. <coughs> In 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 14, it tells us that uh, when Christ died, everyone, everyone died. If one died for all, then all are dead. I used to read that and I think, what in the world does it mean? It means just what it says. It means that God cut off the natural order when Jesus died. He took the entire natural order, including the heavens and the earth and everything that's temporal, and he cut it off from himself, and it died. Now flesh and blood can't enter the kingdom. This present heavens and earth will never survive the appearing of our blessed Lord. It's been cut off from God. It's dead. All died. Now what's the solution to that? then I've got to get connected with Jesus. I've got to get connected with Jesus. If one died for all, then all are dead. Now let's get into the heart of this. If you are ever in Christ's death, you will partake of all the benefits of Christ's death. We read here where Christ's death removes sin. If you're in his death, you're free from sin. We read here where the the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that was contrary to us, was blotted out in his death. If you're in Christ's death, there's no condemnation against you. Satan was destroyed in Christ's death. If you're in Christ, Satan has no power over you. In Christ's death, he abolished death. If you're in Christ, death has no dominion over you. How do you get into Christ's death? Well, it's simplistic and it's complicated both. What a glorious truth. Now, here's a text of scripture that is quite common in our churches. But very few people in our churches know what it means. Our churches have been noted for years for preaching baptism. And baptism was never intended to be preached. It was intended to be experienced. Now, you know, Paul even said, Christ did not send me to baptize. He sent me to preach. And of course, when he preached, both were baptized. Because that's part of believing the gospel. But notice what the Word of God says about baptism. It's Romans 6, 3 through 6. That's in 3 and 4. <coughs> no, you not. Don't you know this? That so many of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried by him by baptism into death. That like as Christ is raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. He was honestly for 
were buried by baptism into death and raised by faith in the operation of God. What was God's operation? He brought us up from death and trespasses and sins. I've baptized quite a few people in my life, not near as many as some, I know, but I never baptized a soul that come up out of the water and said, you know, I'm not sure that I did the right thing. There seemed to be a sense of cleanness. Well, why was that there? Was it a kind of a psychological effect? It was that they'd been raised up by God Amen. from death and sins. Their sins dropped off and they were new and sensitive to God. Just like a newborn baby is sensitive to the sunlight, they were sensitive to God, except instead of God burning them like the sun does a child, it comforts and nourishes them. Buried with them by baptism into death. So I say, let our churches get back to preaching dying with Jesus. And stop trying to talk people into doing something they don't even believe. Where there is no death with Christ, there is no life. See, the real issue is whether we are whether we have died with Christ. If we die with Christ, God will take care of the rest. If we don't, there's no rest to Him. There isn't anything else. I have sensed this in my spirit. Since we moved here to Missouri, it's not unique to Missouri. But the thing that's different about it here is there's so many godly works in this part of the country, but it hasn't made any difference in people. People are still walking around dead, insensitive to God. One of the biggest and most gigantic challenges the church has is to solicit a little bit of interest from the people that are in the church. Like more than an hour a day. It's a bad situation. It's a bad situation. Romans the sixth chapter, verses seven and eight. Now here's the word of the Lord. He that is dead is freed from sin. Amen. Oh, that's good, isn't it? Amen. Is that good? That means sin can't make you sin. Sin can't make you sin. Sin has no dominion over you. He that is dead, dead to what? Dead to sin. He that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. So when someone comes to Jesus, first, first item on the agenda is, are you dead? If you died with me, you will live with me. But if a person comes to Jesus and their senses are real, finely tuned to this world, they will not be welcomed by Jesus. They will not. They must die to the world. Amen. Now even here in this room right here, there are probably thousands of radio frequencies right here in this room, in the air. And if you were still a radio receiver, depending on what type of radio you had, an FM, an AM, a shortwave, or whatever, and you tuned it in, you could pick up these frequencies that are all in here. God's on a special frequency. He's on a no flesh frequency. He's on a not of this world frequency. He's on a heavenly frequency. And when you're dead to sin, you can tune in. Amen. And you can sense in your spirit God himself. You don't want to be like Jacob. Jacob, after he wrestled with God, he said, God was in this place and I didn't even know. <laughs> you don't want to be like that. Even though I must acknowledge all of us probably have been there. Let's resolve never to be there again. Because that's deadness toward God. Paul says of the cross of Christ, he said, I glory in the cross of Christ. I glory in it. I see something in the cross that the normal person doesn't see. I glory in the cross by whom, not by which. Some people quote that Galatians 6.14. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of Christ by which. But that's not what it says. It says by whom. It's the Christ on the cross that's the whom. By whom I am crucified to the world. And the world is crucified to me. The world and I have an agreement. I don't like it, it doesn't like me. And if you're living in Christ, the world doesn't like you either. You may think it does, it doesn't. Jesus said, if you were of the world, the world would love you. But you're not of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. But he said, 
have hated me before I hated you. What makes that happen? It's identity with Christ. It's dying to the world. When someone is infirm in body, and they're about ready to pass out of this life, the things of the world aren't too important. A person's on their deathbed, they're gasping out their last breath. I can tell you, they're not going to call for someone and say, how's the stock market today? They could care less how the stock market was today. Now the question is, are they in the right mind or are people who are concerned in their right mind? I'm telling you, the person who thinks like that is closer to being like God than the person that doesn't. They are losing, a person in Christ is losing his attraction to the world and gaining an attraction to heaven. That's what dying with Christ involves. Now the scripture says that those that are in Christ have crucified the flesh. Now here again is a resting passage of scripture. The Lord doesn't pull his punches here. It's Galatians 5, 24. And you can gauge yourself by this text. This is like a ruler. You lay it alongside your life. Nobody else has to judge you in this. This is strictly a thing you do. You do it yourself. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh and its affections and lusts. Amen. Now notice what this text says. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. It does not say they that are Christ ought to crucify the flesh. That's how it often is preached. That's not what it says. If a person belongs to Christ, if a person is in Christ, if a person is born again, they are at work subduing their sinful nature. Amen. They are crucifying, refusing to let it have domination. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh. That's the natural part of you. That's the sinful part of you. That's the part of you that hasn't been born again. And there is a part of you that has not been born again. You know that, don't you? Everybody that's been born again kept their old nature. It's chained to you. Part of you is pulling down, part of you is pulling up. And when you crucify the flesh, you keep the old part down. Though sometimes we have thoughts, it, it surprises you that you have them. How could I have thought something like that? That's the old part of you that you're to crucify. And uh, crucify is not synonymous with kill. You remember that thief? Two thieves were crucified with Christ. One of them repented, one didn't. The one that didn't, he was raining on Jesus. Now, he was crucified, but he wasn't dead. He was spouting off to Jesus. He was saying, if you can save yourself, save us also. And he was challenging him. Your flesh is like that. The sinful part of you is like that. It's challenging you to listen. But you keep it crucified. And if you're Christ, you will. Well, you gauge yourself where you're at by that. Here it is again, Romans, the sixth chapter. Uh, and verse six tells us that uh, those that are in Christ that are, are dead to the world. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Not it ought to be. That's not what it says. It says it is. When every person is born again, and they come up, so to speak, out of the baptism. They come up with their own nature and nailed to a cross. That's how it starts out. A person starts off that way in Christ. With his flesh nailed to the cross. Now it's up to him to keep it there. They that are Christ. Keep it there. Galatians 2.20, I like this text. I am crucified with Christ. Not I ought to be. Don't what these texts are saying. I am crucified with Christ. Yet I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God that loved me and gave himself for me. I'm asking you tonight, are you crucified with Christ? Have you died with Christ? Have you? So I haven't thought about that. Think about it. You can't leave here without thinking about this. Have I died with Christ? If I have, I will live with him. That's a promise. God's made a promise here. If we die with him, we will live with him. Amen. But if you have not died with him, you don't stand a chance of going to heaven. Amen. Not a chance. God will not back up on this. God is a loving God. He is. 
He wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He does. He is not one of the, and he should perish, but all that come to repentance. He, that's the way God is. But he cannot and he will not let anybody in heaven that has not died to sin. Amen. That has not developed a distaste for sin. That has said, I don't want to sin anymore. I hate it. God, help me to come away from it. And until that frame of spirit comes, the wrath of God abides upon a person. If you are dead, well, let's just read it from Scripture. Colossians, the third chapter. I'm going to ask you to reason on this, whether you're dead with Christ or not. If then you're risen with Christ, seek the things that are above. Where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now, folks, there are some things above. God doesn't ask you to set your affection on something that's not there. There are some things above, wonderful things above, that are for us. And if you're dead, you can want them. You can long for them. You can ask God to give them to you. Set your affection on those things. Not affection. <coughs> affection. Singular. Set your ambition on that. To obtain the prize. Make it your goal. Make it your aim. That when you die, and you will die, that when you die, you will be received into the heavenly abode because you've developed an atmosphere. What does it mean to set your affection on things above? It means culture and appetite for it. You will have as much of heaven as you want. Amen. No limit. Uh, we talk about this once in a while about people. You know, there's, there's a song that says, Lord, build me a cabin in the corner of glory land. If anyone was going to sing that during this meeting, please don't do it. Because I don't want a cabin in the corner of glory land. I'll be right up front with you. And if you do, you've got some real problems. <laughs> like you're out of it. Because there aren't any cabinets in war. There's only mansions there. Amen. Cities there. The city of the living God is there. It's an entire thing it's called a temple. Yeah, there's no small things there, but you have to have culture and appetite for it. That's what the fellowship and church and preaching, that's what it's all about. To develop an appetite for these things. Now to do that, you have to die to this world. You have to, your appetite for this world has to wane. Pretty soon you aren't so excited about what you can get here, and you are very excited about what you can get there. Now you're making some genuine progress. We are dead to the law. This is Romans 7, verse 4. We are dead to the law through the body of Christ. Now one time... We were all married to the law. It was a terrible husband. It was not good to us. Beat us. Condemned us. We had to get away from this law, but we were by nature wedded to the law. And just anyone who lives in sin is riveted to the law. The law is their husband. Condemning them all the time. But in Christ, praise God, we die to the law. That's what Romans 7, 4 says. We die to the law so we can be married to another. As to Jesus, and bring forth fruit to God. But to be married to Jesus, you had to die to the law. What does that mean? The law laws for a lawless person. That's a Timothy's fault, old Timothy. The law is for the lawless. What it means is, you really don't want to serve God. You really don't like the things of God. So God's going to give you commandments and sort of bring you into subjection, like he did Israel. Israel's heart. They weren't for God. Their heart wasn't longing for God. They were alienated from God. They were stiff-necked and hard-hearted. They were different from God. They didn't think like God. So the commandments were given to bring them around and keep them in subjection. I know that there's a lot of church people who think God still operates like this. In fact, I hear preaching like this all the time. All the time. I hear people say, now the Lord says we ought to let this work, but we just don't love it. I feel like standing up and saying, does somebody else have a message? This is not true of the people of God. The people of God love God's law. Amen. They confess in Romans 7.25, with my law, I myself serve the law with 
my mind, I myself serve the law of God. They say, well, David, oh, how love I love thy law. It's my meditation night and day. I like it. I love it. I want it. Why is that true? Because I came, became deaf to the law in its condemning capacity. The law is like a moral image of God. It's like a reflection of God reduced down into words. If you read the law, you're actually reading about the Ten Commandments. You're reading about God. What God's really like. What the condemnation was, that's not what we were like. But when you were married to Christ, when you come into the death of Christ, guess what happened? God wrote his law in your heart and he put it in your mind. That's what he said he'd do. And with that meant you became like him. Now, even though you have your imperfections, you're just as dissatisfied with them as God is. You don't like them either. That's what it means to die to the law. There's a very cryptic statement made in the Romans 8.10. He says, the body is dead because of sin. That's Romans 8.10. Well, I've often thought, you know, when they had the Emmy Awards, wouldn't that be nice to have a big sign or the, the uh, Miss, Miss America Beauty Patch? That would be a book. The Miss America Beauty Patch, that big sign, it said, the body is dead because of sin. See, that's really the way it is, folks. This is really the way it is. Your body, this body, has got to be made to do anything it does for God. It's not going to volunteer. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be sitting there in the pew and your body says, Come on, let's sing a couple of holy, holy, holies." <laughs> You've got to bring it into subjection because the body is dead. It has no response to God. Not at all. It's your spirit inside that's been joined to Christ. That's what's alive. And you reach back and grab your body by the nap of the neck and say, Come on. I'm going, you're going to praise God because I said this. So if you don't feel like praising God, do it anyway. Just make your body do it anyway. Do you think Jesus' body wanted to die? But he made it die. He brought it into subjection. His body swept, as it were, great drops of blood. And Jesus brought it into subjection and died for our sins that we might live. So we joined with him on that day. Now, one, one final point here. All reasons about our, our death in Colossians 2.20. Now, this is a remarkable passage of Scripture. In the, it's a little bit clumsy in the, in the King James Version. I use the King James Version. People say, well, why in the world do you use the King James Version when everybody else uses the NIV? Well, because I've memorized it and quoted it for 50 years, and I'm not changing it. <laughs> this is the way I think. So when I go, I'll just read it and I'll explain to you what it means anyway. See, I, people that are advocates of the NIV, they don't know what it means anyway. So why don't they just read the King James and that makes them admit they don't know what it means. Well, Colossians 2.20, here's what it says. Wherefore, if, now here's the, here's the only important question. If you be dead with Christ, that's the question, are you? From the rudiments, that's the ABCs, elementary things of the world. Why is the living in the world? Are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom, in will, worship, making yourself do it, and humility, and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. I know, I used to say, what in the world does that mean? Here's what it means. If you've died with Christ, that's the, only you can answer this question. Nobody else can answer this question for you. You've got to answer. If you've died with Christ, then how come people have to give you commandments to keep you straight? Hmm? How come people have to lay the law down to you if you really are dead? Well, I touch not, taste not, you know, I know when I was a boy, we'd say don't smoke, uh, don't chew, don't play cards, don't go to dances, don't swear, you know, that little list. It was an unpublished list. Now the holiness people, they published their list. And then we got on for publishing a list. We had a list too, we just didn't publish it. <laughs> what he's saying is if you're really dead, you don't have to have someone browbeating you telling you don't sin, don't sin, don't sin, don't do that, don't do that. Why do people have to be told don't do that? Because they want to do that. Why do they want to do it? They're not dead with Christ. They've never died with Christ. That's the issue. And here's his reason, strong reason. He does 
such not taste not handle which are all the parents of the years, and that is to say, these physical habits, pretty soon your body's going to die, and the, and the earth and the things in it are going to pass away, the lust that is going to pass away, and this life isn't going to be there anymore. So you've got to get ready for the time when those things aren't going to be here. Mm -hmm. And he says, besides that, they look smart. Real good. See, the great religions, great, says small letters. They're really not great. Let's take the Muslim religion. The, the Mohammedan people. Their religion is a religion of discipline. Sheer discipline. You don't have to be a Christian to have spotless morality. You can be a Hindu or a Muslim or a Shinduist. There's a sheer discipline, but here's something that discipline can't do. It can't take away a desire to sin. That's what it means, not an eating honor to the satisfying of the flesh. It means it can't subdue the appetite for sin. It can't make sin distasteful to you. It can't make it obnoxious to you. It can't make you not want to sin. But when you die to it, that is what happens. You don't want to sin. I understand, brothers and sisters, that if anyone says he has not sinned, he's a liar, and the truth is not in him. I understand that. But people in Christ, sin is the exception, not the rule. And when they sin, thank God for this, we have an advocate with the Father. Amen. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he is the propitiation, the covering for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. So we can tell the whole world is paid. Jesus can cover your sin. And when you have that exception, when Satan deceives you, and there you went, there you fell for his delusion. Don't let your sin keep you from God. You come back to him and acknowledge it. And he'll clean you up. Death in death to sin. Now there is no alternative to this people. To make heaven your home, there is no alternative to this. You've got to die with Jesus. Now, none of us can make that happen for anybody else, and we can't make it happen for ourselves. All you can really do is want that to happen. Amen. When Jesus was here, he lived out in the body, historically lived out the principles of the kingdom of God. On a number of occasions, he confronted impotent, helpless people that through the entirety of their lives had been weak and without strength. On one occasion, he happened upon the pool of Bethesda. And there was a porch around this pool, and a great number of impotent folk lay upon this porch. Now, Jesus didn't raise everybody up. I don't, uh, I'm not able to tell you why he selected the person that he did, but... Jesus is like that, and there's no reason why he might not select one of us. And he said to this man, he said, would you like to be whole? And this man said, oh, yes. Oh, yes. I want to be whole. But you know, Jesus, we're not sure when this is going to happen, but occasionally an angel comes and troubles these waters, and while they're agitated... Whoever gets in the water first is healed, and I can never get in there. It looks, looks pretty hopeless for me. And Jesus leaned down to this man, and he said, Take up your bed and walk. Now, how is this person going to do this? There's only one thing this man can do. Want to get up. He didn't have any strength in his muscles. It wouldn't do any good for someone else to give him a hand and help lift him up and prop him up. That wouldn't do it. In his heart, even though before this day he had wanted, he wanted to be healed, but he wanted more today than he ever did before. And as his will was transformed, he wanted to get up. Jesus' power met his will, and he come up, picked up his bed. And see, you might have been lying on a sort of a bed of sin for many years. Unable to get up, unable to change. Maybe you've just been a plain drunk and a grouch. 
When you come to church, you want to make sure everyone's miserable like you are. There's people like that. Maybe down me. You want to change. But you couldn't. If you can sense in your heart that Jesus is saying, I want you to die with me so you can live with me, and your will is changing, you really want to do it, Jesus will enable you to do it. So I'm calling you tonight to a life where heaven is more prominent than earth. That's death to sin. I'm calling you to a life where the earth isn't as important as heaven. That's dying to the world. And I'm going to ask three different questions here. I don't know all of you here. I don't know where your standing is with the Lord. And I don't need to know. I really don't. No one has to tell me. If tonight you have never been born again, you have never put on Christ, tonight's the night you should do it. You should arise and be baptized, not out of mechanics, not out of mechanics, so that God can bury that sinful self and raise you up to walk in a new life. Well, I'm asking if you've never done that, if you've never obeyed the gospel, you say, well, I, I don't think you have to be baptized. Let me tell you something. Someday, you, like me, are going to stand before the Son of God. Now, Jesus was baptized. How in the world are you going to explain to him that you weren't? How do you think, you, how do you think that will sit with him? After all, John the Baptist tried to talk him out of being baptized. And Jesus wouldn't let him. And Jesus didn't have to be baptized for the same reason you need to be. You need to be to wash away your sins. His was to fulfill all righteousness and set the example for us. Beside that, baptism is the only thing you'll ever do perfect. There's not another thing you'll ever do perfect. You will never be satisfied with your repentance. You'll never be satisfied with your confession. You'll never be satisfied with your good deeds, with your prayers. Baptism is the only thing you can do 100%. But if you've never done it, tonight, do it. Here's a second. Let's say that there was a time in your life when you were actually closer to God than you are right now. For whatever reason, for whatever reason, at some time in the past, you knew God better, you read your scripture more, you prayed more, you were more zealous, whatever. You were closer than you are now. If that's the case, you have backslid. That's what's happening. Now, here's the good news. You don't have to stay there. You can just get up, come right back, and Jesus can take you further than you've ever been before. Amen. Amen. So I'm asking if you need to do that to come. I'm asking you to do it publicly. Publicly. Without coercion, Jesus died for us publicly. Mm -hmm. And the third is, if you've been looking for a place to identify with, a body of people who want to worship with, if you want, you want to be surrounded by some people who love the Lord. And you've just been floating around out there from church to church. I'm asking you to settle in somewhere. Settle in somewhere and be a part of somewhere that's serving God. And you need to make that decision to make that. Number 459, I believe, is our closing song.